Well, hey, good morning again. I am uh, so, so glad to be part of a congregation that is uh, uh, more and more just reaching out and trying to serve. And I uh, miss being with you last week as we were down in uh, Redbird Mission down in Kentucky. And I was down there as, as part of that team. And it was a wonderful time as we served a family, a, a gentleman who is uh, 81 years old in very, very poor health and um, uh, could not, uh, he was in a wheelchair and he was being cared for by his daughter, who I think she was in her mid to late 50s, and she was totally blind. Uh, not just light and dark, but totally blind. And they heated their house, and it was just um, uh, sometimes wondered how it was standing. And uh, she, they heated their house by um, a wood stove, and she would, she's blind. She'd have to go outside, down around the other side, outside the house, and inside the basement in order to uh, fire a wood stove to heat their, heat their house. And so we built a 65-foot ramp, and it was just a, a wonderful, wonderful time, uh, time together. And I'm so glad to be part of a, of a uh, congregation, like there have been people working over Dorothy Patch, all of that stuff. And, and what is really cool is we have all sorts of things going on, and I don't even know all of them that are going on. And that's good. That's good. That, that means God, God is at work. Well, you know, about 18 months ago, we started on a journey, and it was a new journey for many of you as we started to do all church campaigns. We uh, go different directions with our studies and our groups for much of the year, but in the fall and in the spring, for between six and eight weeks, we will uh, gather together and we will refine our focus. In the spring of 2021, we did the all-in campaign, and then, uh, then 50 days of transformation in the fall of that year. This past spring, we did not a fan. And during those weeks, there was a, a time of really great focus and, and great energy as, as we uh, grew on a deeper level as individuals and as a church. Well, on the first Sunday of October, we're going to begin the next step of our journey together. It's called 40 Days of Community. And what that's going to be all about is, is what on earth are we here for? God has made us for each other. And I've read the New Testament, and, and I have not found anywhere in the New Testament where a believer was by themselves if there was an opportunity to be connected with a community of faith. And so we're going to be learning together more and more about what that is uh, to be a part of a community and how we are better together, how we need each other and we grow each other. And, and it's going to be all about deepening our sense of community and fellowship and oneness and harmony and, and unity. And then we take it to the streets. It's all about unity. Now, I, I want to point out that there is a difference between unity and uniformity. They're not the same thing. Carla and I, we've been married for 40-some years now, and, and we have unity, but we are not, do not have uniformity on everything. There are certain things we disagree about, and she's wrong, but, you know, we talk about it. <laughs> I'll pay for that one. But it's not the same thing. Unity is not the same thing. So as a congregation of faith, uh, we may not have the same answer to each and every single question, but we know what our focus is, and we are unified around our vision of making and maturing and mobilizing and, and multiplying disciples of Jesus in our community and around the world. And the way we do that is by developing biblical disciples through intentional relationships. We believe that it's in relationship with one another that you and I can fully grow into all that God wants us to be. Look at this picture of the early church from Acts chapter 2. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So the life of the early church was lived out on three fronts. It was lived out in the temple courts. That's, that's the church service. That's us here together. It was, it was then lived out in, from house to house. That's in the home groups. That's the, that's the small groups. And then in the neighborhoods or community around them. 
Now, the Bible says that the non-believers, as they looked at the life and the lifestyle of those believers, there was something infectious about it. There was something that was attractive to it. They saw the fellowship which created the evangelism. They saw the community that resulted in outreach, and they wanted to be a part of it. The truth is, there is something universal in each and every one of us that want to be loved. We want to be connected with other people. We want to feel that we are part of a group. We want to belong. And I think that desire is universal. And, and so when people can find a church where, where the people truly love one another, even when sometimes they disagree about stuff, when they can find a people who are genuinely looking out for one another and are living in authentic community, they are attracted to that. In many of our inner cities, there are, there are a lot of uh, uh, young people who are actively caught up in gangs. Do you know why they're there primarily? They can belong. It's a group of people to which they can belong. And the 40 days of community, that's going to be all about you and I learning more and more about what it means to belong to this church. And it's about loving people in our church, about loving people in a small group that is house to house. It's about loving our neighborhood the communities where we have been placed. And it really is, is all about love. It's all about loving Jesus, teaching people how much they are loved by Jesus, and then allowing the love of Jesus to flow through us. So we have two goals for this campaign. Now, we're going to start in October, but there, there are two things that we really want to happen above any other things. First of all, we want to raise our commitment to the church. We want to raise our commitment to, uh, to, to one another, to understand the community of Christ that's going to last forever and ever, and to invite people to become part of that group of people in that community that's going to last forever and ever. And then we want to extend our influence into the community. We want to serve and to love our community more and more. And to do that, there are five principles that are going to undergird all that we do in the upcoming campaign. First of all, the principle of unified prayer. I've been praying for this campaign for months, all summer long. And I know that the, many of our, uh, of our staff has been praying too. And our small group leaders, as we have worked with them, and we, we have invited them to be in prayer as well. And I would encourage you to be in prayer. To be in prayer for yourself, for what God might have for you, and to be in prayer for, for our church at, at, both, at both campuses. Second principle is consecrated, concentrated focus, where we're all going to be focused around the same ideas. The ideas and principles that are shared during the Sunday morning worship, they will be built upon in the small groups, in some of our Sunday school classes, and, and, and there, there will be great power that will come as you are studying the same stuff that your kids are learning in, in their classes as well. And truly, we are, we are better together. And then there'll be multiple reinforcements. You see, the components of the campaign are built around the things that you and I need to grow spiritually. We need to worship every weekend together. We need to have a daily quiet time. We need to have a small group experience over a cup of coffee where, where we are wrestling with spiritual issues with other people that we know and love and trust. And then there's acts of obedience or our service. So we do that through our seven weekend services. Starting the first Sunday in October, we will go on into November, and then we have a celebration time that's planned and just some other special, special things that we have in store for us. And then your personal devotion time. We will make devotion books available that you can purchase that will go right along and have a space for journaling, and you may want to substitute for your other daily quiet time, or if you've never had a quiet time, this would be a great time to start that, to learn about that. Then there will be a small group study guide that everybody who signs up for a small group, we're going to give that to you free of charge that, that'll help you study along with the DVD. There'll be a DVD that will be shown, and then there'll be a series of questions that the group will work through together. And, and uh, um, anybody can, can host a group in their home. Anybody can lead a group. You don't have to lead a group of, of 10 or 15 people. You can have a group with three. And it's still not too late. If you think, you know, I'd like to, uh, you know, 
uh, maybe uh, my wife and I can get, I can, we can get together with another couple that can be a group. All you have to do is come to the training this Tuesday at 6 o'clock. We'll feed you, and then we'll give you the training that you need to have in order to launch another group. And, and, and we just love to, love to have that. And then there's some, uh, you know, scripture memory verses and campaign events and things like that that all reinforce that. The next principle that undergirds that is behavioral teaching. Now, if you listen to many messages and many sermons, oftentimes they are like 95% information and 5% application. You know what we strive for as we teach is we strive for about 25% information and 75% application. In other words, how do we live out the truth that we learn from the scripture? How do we apply that to our lives? Just because God says something in the scripture, how do we live that out? This is designed to challenge you and me not just to be hearers of the word of God, but to be doers of the word of God. You see, the reality is most Christians are educated beyond their obedience. They know more of what the Bible says than they are willing to follow. And so what this, the campaign is going to be about is challenging each of us to be a doer of God's word. And then the last principle is, that we're going to spend most of our time today looking at is the principle of exponential thinking where you and I have to change our minds. We have to change our focus. We have to expand what we are thinking about in order for God to take the next step in your life and in mine. It moves us from the possible to the impossible. You see, we are growing as a church, and, and that, that, is, that is awesome, and I'm so glad to see that, and God is blessing our church. But I wonder if sometimes we have become content with who we are. We've got two campuses and three wonderful worship services and two different styles and we have great kids programs and an awesome youth program and a choir that's outgrowing its spot. But have we become too content? Have we become so used to who we are that we have stopped setting high goals that only God could help us fulfill? Folks, we have a good church. We have a good church. Amen? Amen? What if God was calling us to be a great church? Could God be calling us to be a community transforming church? What if God were calling us to do that? What if God was calling us to be great? You see, I want you and I want our congregation to believe in God the way, in ways that we have never believed in him before. I want God to challenge each and every one of us to perhaps forgive people that we have never forgiven before. I want God to give each of us to perhaps stand up for our faith in times and places where we have never stood up for our faith before. I want God, I want to believe God for more small groups, for increased attendance, for greater offerings, for more people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. I want this campaign to stretch my faith and yours. I think it's time for us to move away from the same old, same old. Amen? I think it's time. And the reality is you and I do not change until the pain of staying the same is more than the pain of change. So I want, I want to warn you up front, this campaign is going to make us uncomfortable it's going to make us uncomfortable. It's going to be a challenge for us to live our lives differently than we have lived before. So my challenge for you is don't settle. Don't just settle for where you are, wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Maybe you've been on a journey for decades. Maybe you've just been on a few days. Maybe you have... Don't settle. As long as you're breathing, God has more for you. So here's some things about exponential thinking. First of all, understand that exponential growth is possible. I'm not just talking about numbers. Genesis 47 says, thus Israel settled in the land of Egypt in the region of Goshen. They gained possession and they were fruitful and multiplied exceedingly. Folks, McDonald's did it with hamburgers, right? 
Starbucks did it with coffee. Why can't we do it with disciples of Jesus? Why not? Exponential growth. Secondly, it's the New Testament model. That's how it happened. Acts 6, verse 7, the word of God increased and the number of disciples multitude in Jerusalem greatly. They didn't just add a few people. The Bible wants us to have that kind of growth because thirdly, that growth brings honor to God. It brings honor to God. God made them multiply and so so the, the prayer is that God would do that so he would receive more glory himself. Now some people would say, well Pastor Chris, you're talking about numbers. You know, God isn't interested in numbers. Yes, he is. Some of you will remember the story of the shepherd who had a hundred sheep, right? And 99 stayed and one wandered away, right? How did he know if he didn't count? Numbers matter to God because numbers represent people. They represent people who, who have a relationship with Jesus and they, and they represent the lives of people who don't have a relationship with Jesus. And so you and I have, have to be focused on that, not for the numbers, but because people matter to God, people who need to find salvation and purpose and forgiveness and peace and blessing. That's what we're about. We're about being a channel that God can use for that. Fourth, exponential growth gathers the attention of the unbelieving world. Exodus 1 says, The more the Egyptians mistreated and oppressed them, the more the Israelis seemed to multiply, and the Egyptians became alarmed. What if, what if we grew so fast that we had a real major parking problem and, and the city had to do something? What if? What if all the parking lots we have around were kind of completely filled? A lot of Sundays are kind of filled now. But then the streets were all filled, and then people were having to walk multiple blocks in order to... What if that would happen, and people said, what's happening? Wouldn't that be cool? I think God might want to do something like that. Acts chapter 17, there's no scripture, no one for, no uh, screen for this. It says, they turned the world upside down. What if God wanted to do that here? I think the world needs turned over, don't you? <laughs> I think in a lot of cases it has the wrong side up, and so perhaps that's what God wants from us. And this growth is brought by God, it's not a human thing. Exponential growth is caused by God. The steps of growth that you Will take in your life the steps of growth that our congregation is going to take that is something that God is going to do and you and I God does it and we have to cooperate it's a result six of God's blessing it's God's blessing upon us as as he call as he calls us as we, and as we step into the future that he has and it makes him smile seven it's like the in Luke 19 where the, the king exclaimed, well done, your trustworthy servant. You've been faithful with the little I entrusted to you, so you will be the governor of 10 cities as your reward. Some of you remember back in June, we distributed over $2,000 in fives, tens, twenties, and I think there were a few fifties. Some of you had the envelope. Do you remember getting your envelope? Anybody? Yeah, and, and it's been so cool to see how people have been taking that money and putting it to use so that it will multiply, and we're going to celebrate all of that increase back at the end of November, and it's all going to go towards a youth international mission trip, and Shrum and I have already been doing some, doing some work on that, and it's, some of you have been using your talent to bake cookies, and I so appreciate that, okay, uh, and just a creative way that you are using what God has given. But exponential growth can be blocked by unbelief. You and I are the biggest barrier to the great things that God wants to do in our lives. You and I are the ones when we're not willing to step forward in faith into what God has for us. In Mark, in Mark chapter 6, you can go and you can read the whole, whole chapter for yourself. Jesus did this incredible miracle in verse 52, says, they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the multiplied, multiplied loaves, for their hearts were hard, and they did not believe. Exponential growth is believing God for big things. That's a faith factor. You see, the reality is, 
This campaign is going to stretch our minds. It's going to stretch our faith. It's going to call us to live into things that we have never lived into in the past. It's asking God to ignite the power of his Holy Spirit that resides within us. It's for you and me to understand that as a congregation, the glory days are not in the past. Wouldn't it be cool if in 50 years they talked about this decade right here I said, man, imagine what God did then. You and I, in our minds, we're the biggest barrier to that. And being willing to step into the future that God has for us. You see, so many people say they are believers in Jesus. They say that they believe in God, but they live their lives as practical atheists. You say, Chris, what do you mean practical atheists? What I mean is they say they believe in Jesus. They say they believe God does miracles, but they never attempt anything that they cannot do in their own strength. They never step out. They never move into a future that they can't see absolutely clearly every single step. That's not faith. What if we as a congregation began moving into areas where if God didn't show up, we'd fall flat on our faces. What if? I, I came across this verse, and, and uh, it talks about otherworldly things, out of this world things, supernatural things. And, and I, I'd read it years ago, and I forgot about it. Did you ever do that? You read something, and just, I forgot about it. And then I rediscovered it in preparing for this message said this, Lord, I've heard the news about you and I'm amazed at what you've done. Now, Lord, do great things once again in our time and make those things happen again in our days. Amen? Would you pray with me as we pray and say, God, do it again. God, do it again. Now, God, give us the faith to step into the future that you have for us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're so grateful to you for, for your incredible grace, for the, the love and forgiveness that you offer to us, and God, for, for the future that you are calling us into. Lord, as we look ahead to this campaign that's going to start in a couple of weeks, we are trusting you to do something amazing. And that kind of scares us because, God, we, we like what we've got. Would you call us deeper? Would you call us to step out in faith that we have never, in ways we've never done before? God, we know sometimes it's in uncomfortable situations that, that, that we grow and and we're a little afraid of that. We don't like being uncomfortable. Would you build within us the courage to welcome that discomfort because we can see on the other side what you want to do. Thank you, God, for your amazing grace. Amen. Would you guys stand as we close the worship?